I want you to imagine you're trying to meet someone famous. It might be an actor, a singer, a sports star, maybe a world leader of some kind. How would you go about it? What would you do? Do you just turn up to their door and invite yourself in? Hardly not. That's the reason that most famous people have high walls and security guards to keep people like you uh, at a distance. No, if you want to meet someone famous, someone above your station in some way, you usually have to go through a contact of some kind, uh, a mutual contact, someone who knows them uh, and you, and, and they might be able to do the introductions, perhaps. That would be much more successful, wouldn't it? Well, here's a different question. How do you go about having a meeting with God? How do you go about having a meeting with God? That's one thing to imagine meeting the rich and famous, but the sovereign Lord is higher and greater than all the rich and famous put together. And yet how many people have this assumption that we can just saunter up to the Lord and expect to be accepted. The Bible makes clear that by nature that can't happen. Uh, We've seen so far in Leviticus, lots of sacrifices have to be made for our sin. Sin creates something of a barrier between us and God. It separates us from God, much like those high gates and security fences of the rich and famous. So what do we need? What do we do? Well, we need a mediator, something of a mutual contact. We need a go-between. We need someone who can introduce us to the God of the universe. That's what Leviticus 8 and 9 is all about. You may be wondered, what is this all about? It's all about the need for a go-between. In a word, it's about the need for a priest. Someone suited to act as a go-between. A mediator between God and ordinary people like us. Someone who can represent us to God. And someone who can represent God to us. These chapters help to introduce the whole concept of the priesthood in Israel. God, in his love and grace, made these tremendous provisions for a priesthood that would come from the family line of Aaron, the brother of Moses. Aaron and the sons that came after him uh, would be set apart as a group of men with special access to God, and they would Represent the people to God and God to the people. Now, of course, this whole system, the priesthood of the Old Testament is long gone. But the more we understand, friends, who the priests were, what they did, the better sense we will get of our access to the Lord today. In fact, the more we understand, the more we appreciate the Levitical priesthood, the more we can appreciate how all God's people are priests today. All God's people are priests today. And supremely, Jesus is our great high priest. So a number of things to think about as we work our way through these chapters. There are key events Uh, This is something of an ordination ceremony for the priests, how it all started. There's key stages uh, in this, you might call, an order of service. Let's begin firstly with the washing. Verses 1 to 6 of chapter 8, the washing. Moses gathers together Aaron, his sons, And all the people, there's a great public ceremony. None of this done in secret. This is public. The people need to know who their priests will be. They need to witness them being set apart for office. 
And the first thing after publicly assembling is that these men need to be washed with water. Verse 6. That was the first thing. The washing. It was essential for these men. If they were to draw close to the Lord, they needed to be physically clean. And that emphasized, of course, the need for inner cleansing. Inner cleansing from sin. We think of our Lord Jesus, the great high priest, the greatest of them all. He had no such need to be made clean, sure not. Though he was like us in every way, he was without sin. Nevertheless, at the start of his ministry, he too underwent a public washing ceremony. We're told that to fulfill all righteousness, Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. That wasn't a random event, uh, nor was it because he needed inner cleansing. Rather, it was to identify himself publicly with us unclean people. Something significant then, Christ's public ministry begins in a very similar way to that of the Old Testament priest with this washing ceremony. And we do well to remember that, according to the New Testament, all believers today are said to be priests as well. You are a priest this morning. 1 Peter 2 verse 5. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The church is a holy priesthood. The Reformation revived this doctrine under Luther and Calvin. There was a great revival of this, this doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. But it's worth thinking for us to be priests we need this washing ourselves, the washing of regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Uh, when sinners trust in Jesus, they are washed from their sins once and for all. And of course, this should make us think, shouldn't it, uh, of baptism in many respects. The water of our baptism is a symbolic pointer to all of this. Uh, it's an outer physical washing, this sprinkling of water, which speaks, speaks of the need of an inner cleansing on the inside. Uh, baptism is not dissimilar to what's going on here with these priests. They underwent an outer washing, which spoke of their need to be washed inwardly. That's where we begin, first of all. Washing. Washing. Lots to cover here. Secondly, the clothing. The clothing, verses 7 to 9. The clothing. Aaron gets dressed in splendid clothing. Exodus 28 gives us a bit more detail. He gets a uniform for his new job. And here's a picture. We have a picture we could show you this morning of what this clothing uh, might well have looked like. It's well described for us in the Bible. First, uh, there was a, and, and the children, you have a coloring picture for this. This would really help, actually, in the coloring picture. Uh, first, there's a white uh, linen undergarment or, or coat underneath all of it, uh, so that uh, the, the holy clothes wouldn't touch your sweaty skin, most like. Uh, every priest was dressed in this in the white, the white undergarment. But the high priest, Aaron, he had this extra clothing on top. So on top of the white undergarment, he had a blue robe, which went right down to his feet, over which there was something like an apron. It's called the ephod, uh, brightly colored with intertwined gold, scarlet, blue threads. Uh, tied to the ephod, you had this breast piece. And it was studded with 12 precious stones right in the middle. And each stone engraved with the name of one of the tribes. 
And on each shoulder, there was a strap on the shoulders. There was another precious stone on each shoulder. uh, And one stone bore the name of six tribes. The other stone, the other six tribes. And then a turban placed on his head with a golden crown or plate in front of it, bearing the inscription, Holy to the Lord. Remarkable, remarkable costume. Uh, And we should understand this would have been a spectacular sight for the believers there to see. The whole thing very symbolic, of course. In a way, the high priest is dressed in a matter very fitting for the tabernacle. In fact, the blue of his robe matched perfectly the blue of the fabric inside the tabernacle. The whole thing, very color coordinated. And you could say it was a suitable priestly uniform. A visual reminder, these were holy men serving in a holy place. They belonged in there. And of course, deep symbolism behind the engraved precious stones on his heart and on his shoulders. The high priest bearing the people bearing the tribes of Israel upon his shoulders and his heart. He, he represented them. He carried them. You could say, wherever he went, they went. All of this clothing, friends, speaking in a wonderful way, actually, of Jesus Christ, our great high priest, clothed in perfect righteousness. And yet we think of Christ and his going to the cross As he went to make that once for all sacrifice, he wasn't clothed in fine, beautiful robes like this. Now, there wasn't anything impressive about his appearance that day. He went to the cross, we're told, wearing a robe of mockery. A robe of mockery. Uh, Nor did he have a, a crown, a band of gold on his head, looking like a king's crown, but instead a crown of thorns carrying all the while upon his heart and his shoulders every single one of his people, not merely from the 12 tribes, but from every tribe and nation and tongue. And still today we continue to rest upon his heart. Still today Christ is carrying us on his shoulders. The great high priest is representing us before the Father interceding on our behalf, remembering us. This clothing speaks to us wonderfully of Jesus, our high priest. And then as priests ourselves, there's a word for us. After being spiritually washed, we need spiritually clothed friends. In Christ, our filthy rags are taken away. We're clothed in the garments of of salvation were covered with the white linen robes of the righteousness of Christ. Paul in Romans 13 verse 14 writes, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Like clothing, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So after the washing, we have the clothing. The third element of this order of service was the anointing. The anointing. Uh, Verses 10 to 13 of chapter 8 uh, and also verse 30. 10 to 13 and 30. Uh, There was an anointing oil. uh, A special blend of olive oil mixed with fragrant spices. Uh, We can only imagine the fragrant smell, the aroma of this oil. And it was poured out on Aaron's head, we're told. Verse 12, anointing him to consecrate him. We think of Psalm 133. Like precious ointment on the head, that down the beard did flow, even Aaron's beard, and to the skirts did of his garments Go. That's what's happening here. We're told about sacrifices Moses makes. We'll come back to the sacrifices. 
But in verse 30, after the sacrifices, he sprinkles Aaron a second time with blood and the fragrant oil, once again anointing him. So Aaron is consecrated twice. He's anointed with oil, set apart for the office of high priest. And not just Aaron, but, but the tabernacle itself. Uh, just uh, There's a liberal generosity with this oil, friends. The tabernacle, the furniture, the utensils. Verse 30, Aaron's sons and their clothes as well. You have this generous pouring out of all this fragrant, sweet-smelling oil. Oil in the Bible, often used as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Later, being anointed with oil uh, became the customary way people were dedicated to serving God. Both Saul and David, uh, when they were anointed as kings, uh, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. So you can see this is, a, this is a visible way of dedicating these men to the Lord, setting them apart to God. And just imagine the smell lingering with these men, uh, getting into their clothing, just everywhere they went. This aroma sort of followed them. Uh, a priest couldn't sneak up on you. You would, you would smell the priest wherever we went in a good way. This fragrant aroma. And again, in this part of the ceremony, this anointing, we're pointed to Christ. In fact, the Hebrew word for anointing is the word from which we get Messiah. It's Greek equivalent, Christ. Christ, uh, the very title Christ literally means anointed one. Think of his anointing. Having been baptized, we're told the Spirit descended on him as a dove, anointing him, setting him apart. And think of him, uh, if the anointed priest in the days of Leviticus was fragrant and sweet smelling, how much more the Messiah. Psalm 45 verse 8 your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. He's the altogether lovely one, friends. If we think of ourselves as priests, we too have received an anointing. In the words of 1 John 2, verse 20, we've been anointed by the Holy One. That means every Christian Every Christian has been given the Holy Spirit. And by this anointing, we've been set apart, equipped for serving the Lord. And we're to be the aroma of Christ, in Paul's words. The aroma of Christ in this perishing world. The anointing. Very, very helpful, friends. We have the washing, the clothing, the anointing. Fourthly, we have the sacrificing. The sacrificing. This is verses 14 to 36. And then 9 verses 1 to 21. Most of these two chapters taken up with sacrifices. Uh, really, 8, 14 to 9, 21. They begin firstly with Moses offering sacrifices. He offers three offerings, a sin offering, burnt offering, and a special ordination offering. And each time Aaron and his sons had to lay their hands on the head of the animal before it was slaughtered. Verses 23 to 24 give an unusual feature of the offerings. Moses had to take some of the blood and put it on Aaron's right ear and his right thumb and his right big toe. I bet you didn't think you'd be thinking about big toes this morning. Their right ear, their right thumb, and their right big toe marked out with blood. What is that about? We're not told specifically, but 
Surely, friends, this is a very tangible and visible way of showing that the whole man, the whole man is involved and dedicated to this work. The blood of a substitute applied to him from head to toe, quite literally, from head to toe, he needed set apart to the Lord. These priests, they needed thorough forgiveness, complete forgiveness. And they had to offer offerings for seven days. Verse 35. This is a week-long ordination service. Ordinations sometimes get bad press for being very, very long services. This is a seven-day ordination service. Only then... Only after all of it does Aaron begin his work in chapter 9. We read of him in verses 8 to 21, sacrificing his first offering as high priest. Sacrificing would, of course, be his principal duty. It would begin here at his day of ordination and never end throughout his life. Day in, day out, Aaron and his successors offered sacrifices, first for their sin and then for the people's sin. And there is never a day when the high priest could say, all done. Never a moment when he could say, finished. Never any sitting down for the high priest. You've maybe found yourself saying something like, I've hardly had time to sit down today. I've been so busy, hardly had time to sit down. Maybe boys and girls, you've heard your mum or dad say that. I've hardly had time to sit down. That was literally the case for the high priest. There wasn't even a seat in the tabernacle to sit on because he was kept so busy with so many sacrifices. And yet it's wonderfully different for Jesus, friends. Centuries of almost continual sacrifice begin here in Leviticus 9. But the once for all sacrifice of Christ brought it all to an end. The work on the cross brought all of this to an end. And he cried, didn't he, in the cross? He shouted out with a loud voice, It is finished. It is finished. No more bulls, no more goats, no more lambs. And to prove it beyond all doubts, we read in Hebrews chapter 10, he sat down. Listen, Hebrews 10, 10 to 12. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. That's a wonderful thing, friends, to think about. That Christ this morning is sitting down. His sacrificing work is done. And he sits at the right hand of God the Father. And because he is sitting, we praise God, our priesthood looks very different from that of Aaron and his sons. We don't need to keep on standing and keep on working for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus has done it all. His sacrifice is enough and there's nothing more to do. It's so easy in the Christian life to think we must always be doing things to be saved. We must always be doing this and doing that to stay in God's good books. Jesus has done it all, friends, and he's sitting down. Think of the sacrificing, the sacrificing. So we've had the washing, the clothing, the anointing, the sacrificing, and the last thing, the blessing. The blessing. This is chapter 9, 22 to 24. Having offered his debut sacrifices... Aaron steps down from the altar and we read verse 22, he lifted up his hands toward the people 
and blessed them. He blessed them. He pronounces a benediction. We're not told the words he used, but there's no reason to think he didn't use the words of the ironic blessing in Numbers 6, 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. After that, there's a very significant moment in verse 23. We could easily miss it. Verse 23, Aaron and his brother Moses, they go in to the tent of meeting. It would be very easy to overlook that detail. But that's massive, friends. That's massive. Leviticus begins, if you remember, with Moses outside the tabernacle. With Moses unable to go into the tent. But now, nine chapters later, with all the sacrifices instituted, the ordination of Aaron and his sons, the priesthood begun. The way into the holy place is opened up and Moses and Aaron can go in before the Lord. What a privilege they had. What a blessing, the access they had. They could go before the immediate presence of the Lord. And they come out once again, verse 23, and again they bless the people. There's a double benediction in these verses. After which the Shekinah glory of the Lord visibly shines forth. Verse 23 and 24. The glory of the Lord shines and fire comes out from the Lord and consumes the sacrifices. It's showing that he's at peace with the people. That he's accepted the offerings. And the way is opened up for them to draw near through these go-between priests. No wonder the response of the people at the end of 24, when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. They respond, friends, with worship and joy. Uh, they shout with mingled fear and adoration. How much more then should we respond with wonder and awe as we think of Jesus, our greater high priest. In Luke chapter 24, we're told that in a fashion almost identical to that of Aaron, that Jesus, having offered the once and for all sacrifice, Jesus, before he went up to heaven, lifted up his hands and blessed his disciples. Perhaps he even used the same words of the ironic priest. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Of course, the Lord had turned his face toward his people in the person and work of Christ. Quite literally, that is to say, Jesus not only spoke words of blessing, he brought blessing. And there was no fire from heaven bursting forth that day before Jesus left his disciples. No Shekinah glory in the midst because no Shekinah glory was needed. The glory of the Lord was already there, standing in their midst. Paul writes 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, The glory of God is found in the face of Jesus Christ. In the face of Jesus Christ. Striking then to note the disciples in Luke 24 respond to Christ's benediction in the same way the people respond in Leviticus 9, Luke 24, verse 52. They worshipped him 
with great joy. They worshipped and they had great joy. Worship and joy. The same as Leviticus 9. And friends, let that be our response. As we consider the glory of God in the person and work of Jesus, our great high priest. What a great high priest we have. He's done more than give us access. He's done more than act as our go-between. By his priestly work, he has obtained every spiritual blessing for us. And now seated on the throne of grace, he turns his face towards us and with uplifted hands, he pronounces blessing upon us. We long for the day described in Titus 2, verse 13. The day of our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. When that day dawns, the appearing of the glory of our God and Savior, when that day dawns, be in no doubt, friends, we will too shout for joy and fall down. We will shout for joy and fall down. If we're in Christ, if we're not in Christ, we will shout for fear. And we will cry to hide under the rocks. But if we're looking for his appearing, we will shout for joy. And we will fall down. And we will join the great choir of heaven. And we will say with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Because, friends, our great high priest, he is altogether worthy. Amen. Let us come before him in prayer together as we're able. Let's stand for prayer. Oh Lord, there's a lot here for us. And yet, in some ways, it's a simple order of service that's described. And these elements that we've thought about, the washing, the clothing, the anointing, the sacrificing and the blessing, they, they speak to us, Lord, each and every one. Not only of these these earthly priests, Aaron and his sons, but, but they speak to us wonderfully about Jesus Christ, our great high priest, our Messiah, the anointed one. We thank you, O Lord, for his faithful priestly work. We thank you that today we're on his heart, we're on his shoulders. We thank you that today he's seated because his work is finished. We thank you for his words of blessing and benediction, his turning of his face towards us. Lord, we praise you for Jesus. And we look forward to his appearing when we will fall before him with joy and wonder, saying, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain. And Lord, help us in our role as priests, help us as we serve you in the church, in the world, at home. Help us, O oh Lord, uh, to avail of the great access we have to come before you and to enjoy immediate presence uh, before the triune God of heaven and earth. So, Lord, we thank you for the depths of these things Continue to minister your word to our hearts and lives. We pray for those maybe not yet ready for the great high priest to return. Lord, help them to be found ready that they might long for his appearing too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Psalm 97. Psalm 97, and we sing verses 1 to 3 and 7. We use the tune number 7. Psalm 97, verses 1 to 3 and 7. You'll see verse 2 speaks of fire. Fire goes before him. And consumes on every side his enemies. Uh, verse 3 speaks of his glory. Verse 3, third and fourth line. The heavens declare his righteousness. All peoples do his glory see. This, this wonderful, glorious God. And how do we respond? Verse 7. And the, the verse 7 uh, helps us. For righteous ones a light is sown and joy for those upright in heart. Be glad, you righteous in the Lord. Thanks to his holy name impart worship and joy. Just as they responded in the days of Leviticus 9, just as we will respond on the day Christ will return, here this psalm calls us, Be glad, you righteous in the Lord. Psalm 97. 1 to 3 and verse 7, we stand, we praise God together.